Okay, we're gonna get started on our next, not panel, speaker on occupational licensing. Um, it's an issue we've heard about a lot recently here in Wisconsin. Um, currently the state requires a license for 240 occupations. And based on research by our next speaker actually, um, occupational licensing costs the state of Wisconsin 37,000 jobs each year. Uh, this is an issue that we've reported and researched pretty extensively over the past few years. We've talked to cosmetologists, lifeguards, barbers, uh, chiropractors, lots of people who are affected most closely by these regulations. Um, in 27, end of 2017, we did see a little bit of progress on this. The Walker administration passed some bills related to cosmetology licensing, which was great, but uh, it's a first step. So recently you might have heard more on dental therapy, which I believe we'll hear a little bit about. Um, but Dr. Morris Kleiner, he is really one of the most renowned occupational licensing specialists, researchers in the country. Um, like Michael said from our last panel, I kind of had to condense his bio into a few bullets, it seems like. But he started all the way back, um, I shouldn't say all the way back, started his research <laughs> during the Carter administration while he was working at Brookings at the time and really was one of the first people who started researching this issue. Um, now, he is the AFL-CIO Chair in Labor Policy at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. He also is a fellow at the Fed in Minneapolis. Um, he has been a professor at the University of Kansas, an associate in employment policy at Brookings, like I said, visiting scholar at Harvard, a uh, visiting researcher at Princeton, and a visiting scholar and research fellow at the London School of Economics. So uh, without further ado, Dr. Kleiner. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. In order to keep uh, perhaps uh, the expectations about my talk uh, quieted down, I uh, wanted to know how many of you uh, are economists in the room? If you do, just raise your hand. Okay, I, I, I don't see any. Just to let you know that Economists are, are people who are pretty good at math, but don't quite uh, have the personality to become accountants. So, uh, uh, and, and just to get you used to what my talk, uh, the, the, the tone of my talk, uh, most economists, when they're talking to you, uh, look at their shoes when they're talking to you. But a socially adept economist looks at your shoes uh, when he's talking to you. So uh, that will sort of set the, uh, the expectations for some of the things that I'll be uh, talking about, uh, which is occupational licensing. As Julie mentioned, I first got started on this when I was uh, at the Brookings Institution uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, and, and was assigned to the Department of Labor, and my boss called me in. I was a fairly new person. And he said, well, we got uh, some uh, memos from the secretary that w we want a little bit more work on this, and I'm gonna have you uh, look into this. And I thought, what had I done to deserve this? Uh, looking up a bunch of uh, legal statutes and trying to figure out wh what occupation uh, needs to go a couple more years of college. But as I got into it, I found out that it was really a very fascinating and interesting and eventually important issue uh, in the labor market uh, and also for the economy. And you'll also see, I think, uh, why it is particularly important uh, for, uh, for the state of Wisconsin. So would like to, uh, to sort of go to uh, uh, what I uh, call uh, uh, I, I'm a university professor, uh, and I'm away from the classroom today, so I thought I would uh, get back in the swing of things, and I call this Occupational Licensing 101, and that is what's the definition of an occupational license? And, and it's a credential uh, awarded by a government agency that constitutes a, an authority to do a specific job. So if you don't have permission from government in order to do the job, uh, you can be fined or arrested. So it's really a governmental uh, obligation. 
Uh, and in terms of what it is, uh, the government regulators really require uh, practitioners uh, to obtain a license to work, and it's legally related to work for pay. And workers usually obtain uh, a license by satisfying some minimal human capital requirement, that is education uh, and or an exam. And an illustration might be uh, dentists in the U.S. are licensed uh, by attending an approved dental school and passing an exam. And this is going to tie into some recommendations that I'm going to make that come, uh, for, we call in Minnesota, I'm from Minnesota, uh, we sort of view ourselves as Wisconsin West. Uh, so, uh, so that's sort of a, a, and some of the things that we've done uh, a little bit west of here, uh, I'm going to make some uh, p potential recommendations that, that might be helpful with respect to uh, dental therapists, uh, which is an issue that both the governor and the legislature uh, have, have suggested. Uh, so wh wh why is this important? And, and when I was looking at this, uh, back uh, with the Brookings Institution, I, I might mention that I've worked for uh, both uh, the Brookings Institution and the Cato uh, Institute. Uh, both of them are very fine organizations. And I might uh, draw an analogy that, that the Cato Institute uh, is, is, uh, has a great following. And, and, and to sort of develop the analogy, they're sort of like the Grateful Dead. You know, people follow them all around the com country. They have tie-dye shirts uh, uh, with, the, with Grateful Dead. And Brookings is, uh, is also, uh, but they're more like the Beatles. They're sort of a widely known and widely accepted. So when I did stuff for uh, Cato, it, it had a very narrow following, and, that, and work I've done for, for Brookings has had a more widespread uh, following and uh, part of it is just the development of uh, of these uh, oc uh, of the uh, occupational licensing over time, and just to g give you a, a a basic measure of the of the growth of this, is in the 1950s, uh, licensing was about five percent of the U.S. workforce, about five percent. Require, had permission from government in order to do your work. Uh, and if you didn't, again, you would uh, uh, be heavily fined or could go to jail. Uh, now those numbers are somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. So uh, between a fifth and a third of the U.S. workforce uh, has, requires permission from government in order to work. Now there are many reasons for this. Part of it is the, the shift from manufacturing to services. In, uh, in manufacturing, you had unions representing workers. As you moved to the service industry, uh, there was also a need for a web of rules. What are the rules of working in the service uh, sector? And licensing largely has served that function to, to develop a scope, uh, a practice, and what certain occupations can do and what, what others cannot. So that's been a real development of this particular labor market institution. Uh, and uh, it's been very widespread. That is, now there are over 800 occupations uh, that are licensed in at least one state. And they range from frog farmers uh, to rainmakers uh, to the more traditional ones of doctors and dentists and lawyers. Uh, so there's been a wide range of occupations that are licensed. Uh, when you include occupations, and this is only by government, I'm not talking about Microsoft uh, certified programmers, those are all private sector certifications. When you include just government certifications, there are 1,100 uh, registered or certified. And certified occupations are occupations which have a right to title. So chartered financial analysts are certified but not licensed. So only those people can use the title, but other people can do the work. Licensing is a right to work uh, in, in, in that sense. So that's sort of the difference. 
and there are about 65 occupations that are universally licensed. That is, they're licensed in every state. Uh, and there's a lot of variation across, as was shown in tax policy, the same thing is true uh, with respect to occupational licensing. So Nevada uh, and Iowa are the leaders in, in the percentage of the workforce that requires a license in order to work. Why those two states? Uh, Nevada is very heavily involved in gaming, uh, and all those individuals require a license in order to work. Iowa is very heavily involved in insurance, and insurance agents, real estate agents, others require a license. The state that, it's, that is the bottom and is circled over there is South Carolina. They're a heavily manufacturing uh, state. They have, a lot, they have Boeing, they have a lot of car manufacturers, and in manufacturing, there's a very low percentage of licensing. So there, you can see uh, from about uh, 12 or 13 percent, 12 percent being South Carolina, to uh, well over a third of the workforce requires permission from government in order to uh, work for a living. So that you can see across states, and you can see that uh, Wisconsin is sort of in the middle of Wisconsin, and Wisconsin West, that's also known as Minnesota, have about the same, fall into the same category in terms of the percentage of the workforce that requires permission from government in order to work. So that gives you sort of the scope, the breadth of this particular labor market institution. Now, what are some of these 800 occupations that require a license? In Louisiana, um, uh, Mar Marguerite Chauvin uh, is a licensed florist, and, uh, we're, uh, and, and licensing is there to protect the public, it's in, to uh, make sure you're in, not have endangered health and safety. Uh, we want to make sure that if someone gives you an ugly bouquet, you don't have a heart attack. <laughs> So uh, it is uh, particularly important that we regulate and make sure that only qualified state licensed florists in Louisiana uh, provide you these types of services. Uh, so these are among the 800 occupations that are licensed, and they vary a great deal. Uh, in personal care, uh, you have wig specialists, shampoo specialists, you didn't know this morning in the shower, uh, washing your hair, you were performing a licensed occupation. Uh, in several states, shampoo specialists are licensed, including the state of Iowa, dog handlers, land surveyors, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, florists in Louisiana, uh, windshield installers, locksmiths. Now, I can understand uh, perhaps locksmiths that uh, especially relating to our last panel uh, dealing with individuals who've committed felonies, uh, perhaps you might not want someone who's committed a burglary to, burglary to be a locksmith, although they may be pretty good at it. They were a pretty good burglar. But uh, those are individuals who are kept out of being locksmiths as if you've been incarcerated. Uh, others, including and over on the right, uh, those of you who remember the old uh, world wrestling entertainment, that's Hulk Hogan. He is, uh, you may not realize this, he is a licensed uh, professional wrestler. Uh, and I, I'm sure he provides a much better service uh, as a consequence. Uh, I might ask my Jeopardy quiz of the day, can you name the only president uh, in the United States, uh, which ties, uh, the only president in the United States who is both a union member and a licensed worker. Uh, anyone? No. Yes, he was, he was president of the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, I'll give you one, very good, very good. I, sh I shouldn't uh, contradict the person who brought me here, but. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, our current president, uh, Donald Trump, was a licensed real estate agent, and his very famous uh, uh, 
TV show, he had to be a member of the Screen Actors Guild. So he was also a member and currently connect, collects a pension. Uh, is, that's why he can give up his presidential salaries collecting a very nice pension from the Screen Actors Guild as a member of that union. Uh, so a little bit of uh, trivia that you can walk away from uh, today. Uh, so in terms of uh, why is this a particular issue of importance, when you think of other labor market policies, certainly if you pick up the newspaper or go on your favorite blog, uh, you'll notice minimum wage is taking a lot of, uh, what should the minimum wage be? Unions, as I mentioned, uh, that Ronald Reagan was um, a member, was president of his local union. Uh, Donald Trump is, was a, both a union member and a licensed worker. Uh, but licensing, if you add up all the union members and all the people are covered by the federal license, federal minimum wage, uh, licensing is probably 50% more in terms of coverage. Uh, so this is a much bigger, more pervasive uh, labor market institution than license. It's also gotten a lot of attention from the popular press. In the 1950s and 60s, you'll notice uh, no one, it was very much a back burner issue. Now, I like to think that it's me that uh, I started doing research in the 2000s, and all of a sudden, people started to become interested in occupational licensing. I wish it were so, but unfortunately, uh, it was another uh, anecdote, and in this case, uh, around uh, 2010, Michelle Obama was talking to a, uh, a, an army sergeant at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and uh, he was saying that he's going to be moved from Fort Bragg in, in North Carolina to Fort Ord. Uh, I, having been in the military, I kind of keep track of these old army forts, Fort Ord in California, and his uh, spouse, who was a school teacher, could not go to work in California without going back to school for about two years, and they had to go on food stamps. So she became very much interested in the issue of licensing. Uh, she was able to get Jill Biden, the second lady, uh, involved in this, and they also got the Secretary of the Treasury, the Department of Defense, they put out several reports, and interest from, you'll sort of seeing the number being close to zero around when I was writing about this, uh, to this very strong interest among professors and among the popular press uh, on the issue of occupational licensing. So it has also mirrored the growth of this as a labor market institution. The press, you can, if you're interested, you can get on Google and every day there are at least five or six different articles every day dealing with either the growth of licensing or efforts to cut it back. So it's, a, it's become very much an important issue. So what, how can you think about uh, occupational licensing? One way uh, is to sort of say, uh, how do you, uh, what's a way to, to regulate uh, areas that you think ought to be regulated? Well, there's market competition and private litigation. If someone doesn't provide you the service, you can sue them. Uh, there's also uh, issues of deceptive trade practices. So again, uh, there's uh, various groups from the Federal Trade Commission, Department of Justice can go after individuals who don't provide the services they say they're going to. Uh, there's also, uh, there's also the uh, inspection. So if you go into a restaurant, you had lunch today, uh, the food you were provided today was provided by an unlicensed provider of a service. Uh, people who are bakers or prepare food are not licensed, yet uh, they could have done lots of harm to everyone in this room, at least those of us who picked up our, our lunches. Uh, but, uh, but the places that they work at are inspected. Uh, bonding or insurance, uh, that's another way to, uh, to protect the public. Uh, there's also registration. Uh, where individuals, uh, much like Angie's List, uh, those individuals who are on a list and they're approved, if you don't provide good services, you're off the list. Uh, there's certification. Uh, and finally, that is a right to title, but finally there's licensing, which my colleague Lee McGrath at the Institute for Justice has suggested that should be the least used uh, because it does have 
um, a number of neg potential negative consequences in the labor market and for consumers. So uh, these issues uh, have both proponents and individuals who are skeptical. Former uh, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Jackson, who was also the lead uh, attorney in the, uh, for the US in the Nuremberg trials, very distinguished uh, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, noted that the state may have an interest in shielding the public against the untrustworthy, the incompetent, or the irresponsible. So one of the, pro one of the goals or, or duties of the government is to protect the public. Uh, and certainly that would be a, r a rationale for occupational licensing. On the other hand, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, who was a Nobel Prize winner, longtime University of Chicago professor, uh, had a very different view. Uh, when asked, well, look at all these uh, wild, ex expanding occupational licensing. His response is, the puzzle is not why we have so many silly licensure laws, but why, do, why we don't have many more. And the reason he gave is that it's in the interest of the workers who uh, might become licensed, they gain. Uh, they can limit employment and raise wages. Uh, on the other side, uh, that is the other side of why you might want to restrict the, the growth of licensing, is that there's the great argument uh, for the market is its tolerance of diversity, uh, from low quality products to high quality products. Friedman was always fond of mentioning the issue of what's called the Cadillac effect. Uh, the Cadillac effect is uh, in licensing, you can only get a very high quality service. So you can't uh, dr drive a Subaru, you can only drive a very expensive Cadillac or nothing at all. Uh, and uh, the idea that, li that the market relative to licensure permits customers and, and not the producer to decide uh, what, will, what will serve the customer's interests best. And a lot of times in terms of worker shortages, individuals are, 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 are very, especially with very uh, low unemployment rates, workers are always fond of talking about worker shortages. Well, uh, I always uh, see a worker shortage in a very different way. Uh, I think there's a real shortage of Mercedes Benz. I want to pay $15,000 for a new Mercedes, and there's a shortage of $15,000. Nobody wants to sell me one. There must be a shortage. Uh, but in terms of what the market is, if you're willing to bid up the price, uh, there's not a shortage. Uh, if you're willing to pay sixty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000, you can get a Mercedes. And that's the sort of thing Friedman was suggesting in terms of the Cadillac effect. There's either the, the one kind or nothing at all. What's been happening and the reason for licensing, and this is a bit of a comp, a bit, this is some work I've done with a PhD student, uh, and before, this is looking at what happens to wages of occupations before they're licensed and after they're licensed compared to unlicensed workers. So the red line up there is uh, licensed workers and their wages are growing before they're licensed at the same rate as unlicensed workers. But lo and behold, an occupation becomes licensed and over the duration, over many, many years, those wages skyrocket, the red line up there, relative to other workers who have to, are at the whims of the cruel free market. I guess that free market, that free market sort of tames the ability of, of, of wages to go up, but if you're fortunate enough to be licensed, while well, wages take off because they can limit competition, they can ratchet up requirements, for example, physical therapists. When they became licensed, you could maybe get a, a junior college degree, maybe a bachelor's degree, and become a physical therapist. Now, after they've been licensed for many years, you need to be a doctor of physical therapy. It's four years of college, at least three years of postgraduate work in order to get a license as a physical therapist. That limits the number of people who have the time uh, money to become 
a physical therapist, and that's sort of reflected in the growth of what happens to licensed workers versus unlicensed workers. So uh, what happens to uh, the impact on wages? It's not surprising. Some work I did with Alan Kruger, who is President Obama's uh, head of the Council of Economic Advisors, also Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, uh, found that licensing raises wages. Not surprisingly, if you limit supply uh, and increase the requirements, wages go up. It's sort of rules of the market. Uh, and we've done a number of other studies with other uh, colleagues, co-authors, and somewhere between 9 to 15 percent, and that's an average yearly increase in wages, which is the reason why you see so many occupations knocking on the doors of legislatures like this one in order to seek to become licensed. The people who are, the reason licensing has grown in part is that, uh, that the individuals who do the same kind of worker, work, tax their members, go to the legislature, say what a good deal it is for the state of Wisconsin to, to make sure they're licensed, uh, and uh, they, uh, as a result, uh, are able to become licensed, and there's very little pushback. Why should you as a consumer spend your time coming here and arguing against licensing when it's going to cost you $5 more for a haircut, where the, the cosmetologist is going to get 15% more every year for the rest of their life? So they have a big incentive to argue for licensing. Consumers have a very small incentive to argue for the same thing. Uh, also, it has an effect on prices, not surprisingly. Uh, and in the case of, of nurse practitioners, some work uh, we did for the Journal of Law and Economics at the University of Chicago uh, found that uh, if you uh, have more relaxed licensing requirements for nurse practitioners, for example, allowing them to do well child exams, uh, you can keep prices down between 3 to 16% uh, for those types of services. For that one procedure, it could save uh, health care costs by about $600 million per year by allowing mid-tier health providers, by, uh, and that fenced them out of doing a work that in the past only doctors could do. Uh, similar mortgage brokers are able to raise uh, wages by limiting uh, the amount of it, the number of people who can come into these occupations, and the same thing is true nationally for dental services. Quality effects, that's generally the argument for licensing, that licensing improves quality. Although we wish it were so, uh, it, it, it typically is not the case. There have been some studies uh, going back to the early 1900s that said licensing of midwives uh, reduced infant and uh, mother's mortality. Uh, but generally, uh, in terms of dentistry, it's been very weak. Uh, nurse practitioners and, and, and their ability to, to do those ki that kind of work had very little effect. In education, education quality, raising the core requirements uh, wasn't able to improve teacher or, or student test scores. Uh, some work I've done with a, a colleague, a PhD student, uh, uh, Jason Hicks, uh, looking at Uber drivers uh, in, in, in certain state, in certain cities, for example, New York, you must have the same requirements to be an Uber driver as a taxi driver. It takes, several, uh, takes several months, several thousand dollars to get that taxi. So uh, in, in New York, an Uber driver and a taxi driver have the same requirements. Uh, when they pick people up at Newark Airport, do those people get a better ride in terms of either satisfaction or uh, hard accelerations? The, the, they have uh, jackrabbit starts or hard brakes. Do the, the, the licensed people who pick up those people at Newark Airport, which are licensed New York City drivers and unlicensed New Jersey drivers, do they provide a higher quality service? And the answer is no. Uh, there's no difference, even though uh, the licensed New York drivers have to go through additional training. Uh, licensing and Yelp drivers, Yelp ratings, there wasn't much difference. And also the same thing was true for fund managers not being able 
uh, to have much of a difference. One thing that licensing does do is reduce interstate migration. And uh, the, the, the uh, blue line is the decline in interstate migration, people moving between Wisconsin and Wisconsin West, right? Uh, again, that's Minnesota. What, has there been a, 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 a movement between states? What's happened over time? And the red line is the growth in occupational licensing. So those are sort of correlations. But we've also done some work with a colleague, Janet Johnson, at the Humphrey School, where we've looked at what these requirements are and look at, looking at it across occupations that are heavily regulated. So for example, teachers. There's a dramatic decline of, of the ability of teachers to move across state lines. We had uh, someone who wanted to move to Minnesota. It was a physics teacher in California, wanted to come to Minnesota and uh, teach math. And we said, the, the teacher board said, no way, you taught physics. Uh, and you, you can't teach math unless you go back to school for a year and a half. And uh, we all know that math in California is different than math in Minnesota, right? So uh, these serve as very rigid barriers to entry, very rigid barriers to movement across state lines. And yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, there was an, an op-ed talking about the governor of, of Arizona said, if you get a license Anywhere in the country, you can come to Arizona. We need you, we want you. We're, we're experiencing dramatic population growth. So if, you're, uh, if you get a license in Wisconsin, and you wanna take advantage of the growth in population in Arizona, come one, come all. And the idea is that this would increase access to people who need licensed services and keep prices lower uh, for the people of Arizona. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. It certainly seems to have quite a bit of state uh, uh, impetus to get that law passed. Would you recommend that we consider emulating Arizona? That come one, come uh, well, the, that, I, would, I would think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Come one, if you're licensed in another state, uh, uh, that would certainly increase the, amount, the ability of people to, to come to Arizona or come to Wisconsin. Uh, and, and, that, uh, and, and what are sort of the national cost benefits? So this is a study I did with an MIT economist, Evan uh, Soltis, uh, looking at sort of uh, occupational licensing, labor supply, and human capital. And what we found was that not surprisingly, and this is the most recent data, I, I gave you some of the older results earlier, that, that if you're licensed, you get about a 14% bump in your earnings. You work more. Uh, because uh, leisure becomes more expensive, uh, because w uh, if, you're, if you're sitting at home as opposed to working, uh, it's costing you more money, uh, but it reduces employment by, by a lot, and uh, about 27%, so you're able to restrict employment. And uh, the costs over the benefits were about 10%. So uh, if an if a occupation comes and says, we need to license music therapists, which is the case in Minnesota. Every legislative session, you know, you don't want to hear bad music. Uh, uh, you, you know, the Eagles may not be your favorite band. Uh, so, so if you are a music therapist and you're coming to be licensed, they have to show they can overcome in terms of reducing uh, issues of, of uh, health and safety by 10% because they start in the hole, because that's what it's going to cost uh, the, the state uh, in that occupation if they're going to be licensed. So that's sort of the hole that they're starting from. They can overcome it if they can show they're going to reduce, uh, there's going to be significant gains because of licensing, but that's where they're starting from. They also, uh, if you're going to be uh, licensed, uh, there's, uh, there's a real cost in terms of you're having to spend a lot more time in terms of specific training, learning how to become a cosmetologist with someone who goes to an unlicensed occupation, doesn't have to learn that specific, those specific skills. And there's really very little uh, evidence that consumers are willing to pay for additional uh, licensing. That is when you go to interior designers in Florida, uh, who are licensed in the commercial sector and they bid on jobs in the residential sector, 
Uh, there's no difference that in terms of consumers willing to pay more for someone who is a licensed commercial interior designer. Uh, so these are uh, findings and, and uh, implications uh, of, of occupational licensing. And uh, these are some of the estimates for Wisconsin when you, uh, uh, in terms of putting together the idea at what cost, what is licensing cost uh, Wisconsin, and, and this is just to give you a, a brief overview, about uh, almost 18% of Wisconsin workers are licensed, about 6% are certified, that is, they have a right to title, that is, only they can use that title, uh, and, and as opposed to uh, right to work, and about 12% are licensed. So jobs lost, that is people who could be working in that sector who are working elsewhere. It's not, they're, they're not unemployed, they're just going to another sector to find jobs. That's about 37,000. Uh, because they're not working in the licensed sector, uh, that's costing uh, the, the, uh, the state of Wisconsin about uh, $133 million. And uh, the estimated misallocation costs are over uh, $3 billion uh, in the state of Wisconsin, and that is a misallocation. What is a misallocation? There's a company that uh, uh, I did some work with, uh, work with called Ecolabs. They install uh, commercial refrigerators and uh, stoves in uh, hospitals, restaurants. When they install these stoves in restaurants, they have their own people who are trained to install them. But when they do it, they have to have a licensed electrician, a licensed plumber, watch their people install it at between $100 to $150 an hour who are watching their person. So that's a misallocation. That's what, uh, in, in, in the old labor relations terminology, is feather bedding. Uh, these people are, are, are being paid, but they're not necessarily contributing much value added. Uh, and the economic returns, that is, what people can make who are in licensed occupations in the state of Wisconsin are almost 15% above unlicensed workers with similar credentials. So I uh, want to thank you for your attention and look forward to a lively round of questions. There's a couple of criteria, unscrupulous or incompetent people out of an occupation. Uh, I might add that uh, where I spent work on my day job at the University of Minnesota, almost no one is licensed. Uh, so we can hire anyone off the street and put them in the classroom. And some of you gone to college may have thought that's what we, at Wisconsin or Minnesota, that's what we did. But, uh, but universities, and we have, if you look at the, the list of the top 30 universities in the world, uh, two-thirds to three-fourths are American universities, and none of them uh, are licensed. So to teach, at the to teach down the road here uh, at the University of Wisconsin, you don't have to pass a state exam, but to teach at a high school in Madison, you must pass a state exam. And if you're coming from another state, you have to go back to school to make sure there's the right way, the wrong way, and the Wisconsin way. Uh, so you need to learn the Wisconsin way to be, to, to be in a classroom. There's the interaction. I, I provided what happened to unions and what happened to licensing has grown. Unions have declined. Uh, but uh, unions are very powerful uh, in, in the area of public education. And uh, the, the requirements uh, are, haven't been lowered. In fact, if anything, they've been ratcheted up much like I mentioned the example of physical therapists. Well, when you enter a licensed occupation, it really provides sand in the labor market and not grease. That is, that, that these people are there for a long time, and uh, the fluidity of the labor market tends to be restricted because all these occupations have become licensed. And it's hard to get in, but once you're in, you don't leave.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're really fortunate to have you here today. As Julie had indicated before, Dr. Kleiner is really the foremost expert, I think, in the country on occupational licensure, so we're very fortunate. And talk about an area that's ripe for bipartisan movement in this state. This is it. This isn't a right or left, Democrat, Republican uh, area. This is one where, as I think the representative, I hope you're smiling in agreement. This is, this is, an, area, this is an area that's ripe for bipartisan. <laughs> uh, so thank you. I just want to say one other thing. This is an ongoing area of research for us at the Badger Institute. Over the next year, we're going to be taking a close look at the composition of every licensing board in Wisconsin. Who sits on them? Are they market participants? Is there public representation? What are they doing? Uh, so I hope you'll stay tuned for more research from us on that. And uh, again, thank you very much.